Which was released, uh, I just looked it up. Oh, dang it! Oh. Uh. <laughs> Welcome to No Clip. I'm Chad Rowan. I'm JJ Artemis. And I'm Andy Kinnick. And today we're going to be talking about The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D, which was released in February of 2015. Uh, on the Nintendo 3DS, and was obviously developed and, and published by Nintendo, mm-hmm. uh, it being a Legend of Zelda game. And for the sake of complete of, of being complete about it, uh, it is of course a remake of Majora's Mask, the N64 game that was released in the year 2000. We good? We good. <laughs> all right. I will have cut out all of that bullshit, but uh, I'll have you know it took me three attempts <laughs> to say the correct date for this game, so mm-hmm. there's that. Prime blooper real material. It really is. i look forward to that, October 3rd, 2018. Um, <laughs> so, uh, before we get into anything, um, I assume that this is my reasoning, and if you guys want to push back, go ahead. <laughs> We played the 3DS version of this game because, as far as, like, I'm concerned, this is the definitive version of this game, uh, just for the sake of convenience. Uh, the the game has, like, touchscreen controls that were added, and they made, like, a few minor alterations, but otherwise it's pretty much identical. Uh, and the touchscreen controls and the gyro controls, I think, really add to the experience of not being in a menu all the fucking time. Yeah, the uh, I wouldn't disagree with that. I don't think many people would. Like, the game, if you go back and play, like, Ocarina or Majora on the N64, the controls are a bit wonky, and, um, the like, the updated versions on the 3DS mostly mitigate that. Yeah. So it's worth it just right there. Yeah. And it's a, it's a nice visual upgrade. It's not too different, but, like, it looks nice. Notably, the 3D actually looks pretty good, like surprisingly good for uh, my experience with 3D games, which is largely negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, The one thing that holds me back from saying that it's a completely superior version is that since it's running on the same engine that they used for the Ocarina of Time remake, it has a kind of like light, cutesy feel that isn't quite as present in the far worse graphics of the <laughs> N64. Uh, so it's less creepy in retrospect okay. than the original game is now. Yeah, I guess the muddier textures and mm-hmm. in, in everything in the N64 version do make it a little little more like uh, gritty, I guess. Sure. I think I, I, I agree with that largely. However, I think, uh, and I mean... Not to jump directly into this conversation, uh, but the they kind of went out of their way to the models that they did make specifically for this game all feel so unique to it. Like they like all of the the new stuff for Majora's Mask is very Majora's Masky, and the the crisper graphics I think actually add to it. So I I would argue that not having quite as blurry and quite as polygonal uh, <laughs> models makes this game more effective, but... Mm-hmm. That yeah, might I mean, me. in certain ways, it's like a... It's, it's a not, give and take. Yeah, it's not a black and white thing. So what do you mean by Majora's Mask, you Chad? Uh, I'm gonna say riddled with sadness. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> by riddled, you don't just mean there's a lot of sadness. You mean like the bones of an elderly creature <laughs> shaking on its last gasps of life, like that kind of sadness. Uh, kind of. Okay. See, and I think what's um, so great about like the um, the tone of the game, like that like you said, it's all very sad, mm-hmm. uh, is that it's not in your face about it. Like it, they really let you think to yourself, "Oh, this is sad." They don't tell you that it is because right. like you'll do. A quest line like you'll do a temple and then like you'll you'll save the deku princess or whatever and then he save the monkey from being executed and whatever <laughs> and then at the end you just have to undo it all 
And then, so you know, the next time you're doing something else, that monkey's getting fucking killed. You <laughs> yeah. know, like... <laughs> and that's, like... So you, and they don't tell you that. That's something that just, like, waves over you. It's yeah, like, like, everything that you do is undone. Nobody calls you on the phone mask to be like, by the way, we killed that monkey. <laughs> 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 Goodbye. But I, I don't, there's nowhere in the game that it's more evident than uh, in, like, Goron Village. Because, it, it like, literally when you finish the dungeon it becomes springtime and then when you go back in time oop winter again yeah all the gorons are freezing to death <laughs> yeah enjoy that but uh yeah i mean this the the tone of this game is arguably i think the, well, some of the best executed like thematic some high quality thematic. I know, yeah. yeah. It's it's You're really pausing <laughs> for dramatic effect. That's what for it was. Thematic for thematic effect. For thematic effect. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's some of the best executed uh, thematics. We'll go with because uh, I'm just going to shorten yeah. that pause okay. uh, that I've really ever seen because it specifically because it doesn't do that. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't tell you things directly. And, like, part of it feels like it's a technological limitation where they were like, we can't put so much stuff in this game that it that would tell the story. And so the way that they work around it is by just having everything sort of go get worse over time. And it, it drives the point home really well. Mm-hmm. It, things just kind of pile up. Because mm-hmm. like, you, as you do more and more things, like it, you'll even if you don't think about that initially, like you're gonna have the thought, like, oh, I did this last time, so like now that hasn't happened in this timeline, and right. like you know, you'll start to think about that inevitably as you go through the game, just because of like how many times you repeat the cycle. Yeah, it's one of the subtlest games I think I've ever played. Uh, not just not because it's extremely undertoned, like some kind of walking simulator or something, but because it's so good at misdirection because of the art style and the expectations that are already set up by being a Zelda game that it mostly kind of meets on a moment-to-moment basis. Like, you're still walking around, like, in Goron Town, pulling out a sword and, like, dueling a stupid werewolf that you, like, kill and then dissolves into strange, like, purple fire, like, whatever they use in Zelda to represent death that isn't blood. Right. Uh, and yeah, so moment to moment, you can see a screenshot of this game and be like, oh, Zelda game. Uh, and it holds your attention with those mechanics and with that kind of engagement so subtly that y- you have to independently look beyond the facade and beyond the color and the fun and realize what's actually going on here. Outside of, like, the ending segments with the moon and some specific designs like the giant eyes of the bosses that inevitably show up as their weak points and Majora itself uh, and I guess the soundtrack too there just isn't a lot of the game directly pointing to frankly its own major themes and the things that have made it so enduring uh, in game culture since it came out I agree with like 98% of what you just said, except I could not possibly disagree more about the soundtrack. Because I feel like the soundtrack is the... The soundtrack acts like a laugh track in a sitcom, where if you're unsure how to feel about something, it's always there to reinforce the feeling that it's trying to get across. Like... Uh, the cellos, my god, the cellos <laughs> in the Clock Town theme when you get to the third day. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you're like, <laughs> but it's just like underneath of it, it's just this like, <laughs> like these low tones yeah. that always just sort of underscore everything and it makes you realize like everything sucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were but, agreeing. But I was excluding an, yeah, that. That's an oh, oh, you were excluding yeah. that. Yeah, it's, that's yeah. not subtle. That is one of the times they just point to it and say, like, this is how you feel. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, um... God, what was I going to I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Since you kind of just, uh, mm-hmm. explained yourself. Something about cellos? I was gonna, oh, I was going to say that it was appropriate there to, like, actually be like, the moon is here. <laughs> 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 you can't ignore it anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like for the mo- or for the music to shift tone like that, yeah. yeah. Because like the Orton, like the regular Clock Town theme, 
initially you're gonna be like oh it's like a jaunty happy town theme but like the more you hear it you're like oh this is like really frantic <laughs> and you know like it, it it sits in like a lot of the things in the game like after you've played it a little bit you kind of get it which you know we've already said is the, the subtlety of the game right and i also i kind of have to give credit as much as it pains me to give credit to Ocarina of Time for things. That is not true. I'm I'm far more likely to give credit to Ocarina of Time for something than play Ocarina of Time. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like the existence of Ocarina of Time uh, just one year before this game came out, it makes the tone of Majora's Mask work because they established so much in Ocarina that they could then subvert in Majora. So while they're using the same models and the same stuff, and they even have, like, I feel like there should be a subgenre of video game jokes labeled under, like, Zelda comedy, which is where you go into something and they present you with an obnoxious situation, and then you have to solve some kind of a riddle or a puzzle, and if you fuck it up, then they just hit you with, like, some kind of gag. So what I'm thinking of is in, in like, Clock Town, like, every NPC interaction, like, Link falling asleep while listening to uh, that old woman's story, or, like, there's a hand in the toilet, and of course what you have to do is bring it paper, which, like, there's no ghost ass on the toilet. Like, I don't see where the, the paper is really going to be used is in the toilet already. But, like, this kind of thing that was established in Ocarina, like, this tone, and then they present it in exactly the same way, but in different circumstances. So your familiarity with Ocarina helps you realize when things are amiss in Majora. Yeah. And a lot is amiss in Majora. (laughs) (laughs) There's much to do about Termina. Too much for you to fix, ever. Which Mm -hmm. I think is an uninteresting theme of this game that also helps make it hold a lot longer after you beat it. Because there's never really any point, even after you've beaten the game, where every single thing that could have been fixed is fixed. Like, you have to get to a point where you go, like, oh, like, I have made the conscious decision while saving the world to leave these things broken. And that's a really sad thing to think back on after your jaunty adventure. It's like the Superman complex, where, like, he could be constantly saving everybody, so every second he's not, he feels guilty about it. Right. Yeah, that kind of thing. I also don't want to be, like, a, a butthole. But uh, I kind it kind of depends on your interpretation of how like the game works mm-hmm. because you do certain things that persist on your person so like obtaining masks and things so like presumably after you have the blast mask that guy wouldn't mug that old woman anymore but like also maybe he would i'm not really convinced one way or the other he doesn't know that she doesn't have it true but then also uh the like at the end like a lot of the side quests involve just like doing things for people before they're killed by the moon or in like very rare instances saving them from being killed by the moon and if you stop the moon you do also save those people and there are other problems that seem like you could probably sort them out as long as there wasn't this like (laughs) falling celestial body Mm -hmm. uh so i would say yeah it sucks for like probably 30 percent of everyone at the end of the game it's a lot of everyone there's a lot of everybody (laughs) i'm just arguing against it being like everybody or the majority it's not the majority right stop i'll never do it again good it's not and again it's and you do a lot of heroic things in the game despite how hard the game at first tries to set you up and then like make you fall as far back down after your ocarina of time high as you presumably can be uh it's just it, the everybody was the operative word in what i was saying like there's always going to be someone and be like oh god I've got to fuck that, like, and... <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> Bad time I for a I gotta fuck that girl at the ranch. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> before the moon falls. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we have to go. I'm like, oh, yep, I guess that, that girl just got abducted by aliens. She's probably being moon fucked currently in a different way. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, man, those aliens. I feel like there isn't a lot to say, <laughs> but, like, my, why, the, those aliens, these, they're, <laughs> the fact that they're there is baffling enough. Mm-hmm. I do love it, though. Yeah. Except for, I kind of don't love it. I'm, like, in the middle on that side quest, well, but... I, I think it's it's a clever reusage of, like, the Posol, like, character model. Right. It's just... And they're not as explicitly stated to be aliens, but we all know they are. Right. Uh, I don't know. I think it fits. I think it fits. Especially as just, like, a side quest and not, like, something significant. Oh, yeah, no. Totally, thematically, and, like the literal interpretation of them I'm all on board with. The only issue I have is that, like, riding around and shooting mm. them with arrows is not really all that fun. Dude, I don't know. I have been on such a Zelda arrow mechanics kick. Okay. I really, really do I, uh, enjoy using, like, the gyro motion controls as those camera controls, and it made a lot of the horse-bound, like, shooting and riding feel like inconsistent because in a very small way when you're holding a 3ds you're kind of riding a horse you're bouncing around and you're not being stable and that feels like it's being reflected because you can't really aim perfectly because it's gyro motiony nonsense so you're like oh you just barely get there and then you get the arrow off yeah. and i hate that you can't control epona with the analog stick though like while you have the bow and arrow out mm -hmm. that's what makes it feel bad you gotta commit. to me yeah yeah also, so you just, have to, like, exit in and out of the, you know, the gyro controls. In order to steer. And it, yeah. yeah. It, it is awkward, especially, like, when it zooms back out. It's, you don't get control immediately, so you have this, like, brief moment of sort of trying to steer, but opponent's still on autopilot mm -hmm. for a second. It's, and then it's, if you turn too sharply, she just stops. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. This is just a classic horses in video games all suck always <laughs> and have never been good <laughs> problem that I don't think that is ever going to be solved. I, I, I wanted to, to parlay that conversation into a separate one uh, that JJ kind of brought up about uh, like the gyroscope aiming. Because I think outside of this one specific instance... It is great, generally. Yeah. Like, it's, it's... I don't know exactly how they pulled this off, because I've never seen a game get it right on, on like, stage one, but the sensitivity feels, like, so crazily, crazily properly tuned in a way that just never happens for some reason. Like, I feel like even in Ocarina, I felt like I had more trouble with the gyroscope aiming than I do in Majora. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it is kind of uh, remarkable, especially, like, I think the first instance of the gyro controls for Nintendo was the Wii, mm -hmm. and man, did the gyroscope in the Wii remote suck. <laughs> and it's crazy just, like, how good it is in the 3DS and the Wii U and onward. Yeah, because they even introduced Wii Motion Plus to improve that. And it still was kind of janky and needed recalibrated every 15 seconds. Right, so. and it, it's like night and day, like how much better it feels. Yeah. So I don't know really what that's all about, but it definitely did aid in, like, general game playing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's like that bridge of the gap between, like, playing, like, something on PC and a console. Like, the gyro is, like, kind of like the perfect answer to how to, like handle like aiming and shooting i think on a console yeah fine adjustments and you're gonna be doing a lot of aiming and shooting because pretty much all of your in dungeon upgrades are gonna be some kind of arrow yeah this game only has like five items that aren't masks mm -hmm. which i think is is not a downside great i think that it's just perfectly fine uh but yeah the majority of the time that you're you're around and every uh like transformation with the exception of Goron Link has a projectile as well that aims in the exact same way. So yeah, it's a lot of a lot of shooting stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow I feel like this game had fewer puzzles in it where all you do is shoot a thing. Like, d despite the fact that there's so much shooting available to you, they seem like they put a lot more effort into making, like, each interaction feel unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the advantage of this being an iterative sequel, is that they uh, they chose to focus on different stuff. There's way less diamonds to shoot and eyeballs to shoot. Right. 
I feel like, and I don't know, it, like this, this keeps coming up as like a, a downside when people talk about my favorite Zelda games. Like as of right now, are like Breath of the Wild, Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, and ever those three games in particular. Everybody likes to talk about how there aren't enough dungeons, and I look at the quality of the dungeons in this game, and I'm like. Hey, maybe if they made less dungeons, it'd be good. Because there's so many dungeons and like sub dungeons in Ocarina that I just don't ever want to do. Uh, and there are dungeons in pretty much every other Zelda game that just like don't enthuse me. But like every one of the four in Majora, I think, is generally good. Uh, the worst one is is probably the water temple yeah. again because <laughs> video games and water just don't mix or didn't in two thousand. So video so, games are oil. Yeah, yeah. video <laughs> games are uh, they, they don't mix like video games and water. Yeah, I think, I'd actually disagree with, in, at least in terms of Majora or not disagree but like I feel differently. Uh, I found the dungeons in this game to be pretty easy and kind of unsatisfying like uh, compared to like other zelda dungeons like it felt like the first two especially i felt like i just like kind of walked through them and there wasn't really much to figure out i'm used to walk through uh, i didn't (laughs) (laughs) the the great bay was just kind of uh, not fun okay yeah uh not really all that hard and well stone tower temple was giving me trouble but that's the only one. Yeah. I think uh, Stone Tower is definitely the hardest of them, uh, just based on the com- on complexity alone. Like, there's a lot going on. And it's also the one where the mechanics take a slight dip because you have to keep playing the Elegy of Emptiness, mm-hmm. uh, which hurts. And <laughs> this is one of my biggest pet peeves in games. I think I brought this up on the Earthbound episode. Um, you have to leave the temple... To shoot the di- the ruby outside of it to flip it, right? That like that's come up in several other games. I think even in other Zelda games, where like in order to progress, you basically just have to give up and leave mm-hmm. to figure it out, and that just feels bad because <laughs> you just spend a ton of time running around the dungeon, being like, "What do I do?" Right. Before you give up and leave, and then figure it out. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but like you have to it, when it isn't like painfully obvious you step on a switch a chest appears on the ceiling and you're like oh, i bet i have to turn the temple upside yeah, down yeah but like there's nothing to suggest that shooting the ruby is what is going to cause that well right. i think the goro master garo master the ninja master guy yeah. says something cryptic about shooting something red <laughs> and sacred but, uh, so you're just running around shooting everything that's sacred. Well, no, I thought going, he was like... referring to the little sun <laughs> emblems everywhere. Right. It's, he said some kind of like sacred glowy thing. Whatever. Yeah. But anyway, well, that was that's a my little tangent back yeah. to what you were saying. Well, I was just gonna because I actually I, I agree with this to some. I actually don't recall this uh, would have been my third time through it if I'd actually finished the game this time, but I didn't. Oops. Uh, but I've played it twice before. And I don't remember the first time having an issue figuring out that you had to turn it upside down, but I totally could have. Uh, it was just so long ago that I don't really... It, it just doesn't come to me. Mm-hmm. But I do agree that it's even kind of a problem after you know, because you have to exhaust your options within the temple before you go flip it in order to uh, like know that you're doing the right thing. Can we talk about the aesthetic of Stone Temple Tower? Sure. Okay. What are what is going on <laughs> in Stone Temple Tower? Okay. Okay, explain yourself a little more. What what is off putting to you? Lots of weird, vaguely ancient Stone Age masks and architecture. Mm-hmm. A giant hand pointing to the sky with a flaming finger. Uh, and most of the temple is made out of blocks that are themselves carved to resemble a man, like, stuck in a box, whose tongue is so large that it goes down the front of his face, under the bottom of the box side, and under, in that tongue, and below his butt, (laughs) is the Triforce, on on each location. Interesting. Yes. I didn't notice It is a gross man... (laughs) Like, sitting and or shitting on the Triforce. Because it is Nintendo... 
uh, a high or it is a Zelda game specifically, I'm sure that that has some kind of real real world inspiration. <laughs> like I bet there's a video that analyzes the influences of the Stone Tower Temple. I do not know anything about them. <laughs> I would also, but I bet that's out there. I would also like to enter into evidence the fact that inexplicably after completing it, the boss fight involves you becoming enormous and punching worms to death. Yeah, like I can almost imagine there's like a specific like fable or something that the, it references. Cuz like I subconsciously now that you bring it up, mm-hmm. like the feel of even just a kind of valley and um the Stone Tower Temple and even the whatever castle. I don't remember what it was called. Whatever. But you know, oh, oh, you know, I know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you need to beat the boss to get into the temple. But um, that whole area felt like really thick with atmosphere, like more so than the other areas, I think. Like it had a backstory. It's so many zones, especially in Zelda dungeons, are so thematically clear. Like, you can talk about Zelda dungeons as the fireplace, the water temple. Yeah, as I just <laughs> did, despite mm-hmm. the fact that it's not called the water temple anymore. It's, yeah. great, it's, it's the Great mm-hmm. Bay Temple. But, yeah, whatever. The point is that it's that you can say that, and I know what you're talking about thematically. Right. I have no way of describing the stone temple thematically that it's 100% accurate. Like, the closest I can get is, like, a creepy Mesoamerican Satanist, and that's off in yeah, so many ways. It, it feels almost like it's tied to the theme of death in the area, like, almost kind of like an ascending to the afterlife kind of thing. Yeah. Right. The finger pointing to the sky, the fact that it's a tower you climb. Right. Flip it upside down, something about... Heaven and, hell. heaven and hell. <laughs> yeah, that, that was. I was, that was the one thing that I couldn't like, uh, like reconcile with that is like the flipping it upside down because it's so core to what the temple's about, and yet doesn't seem to make sense to like. Yeah, you ascend and then you you kind you do a little mm. topsy turvy and then you know, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's weird because uh, well, if you look at Icona Valley in comparison, because Icona Valley is like the the like desert area of this game, mm-hmm. um, and it's weird that Nintendo has so frequently gotten right deserts, which no one else seems to be able to do. Like for any everything from uh, you know like Skyward Swords. Uh, the desert Sansi. area is the best area in the game. Yeah, it's like the coolest, like aesthetically and even mechanically as well. Uh, Mario Odyssey's desert level, like they always have these like clear aesthetic themes that make the literal most boring <laughs> landscape in the history of planet Earth an interesting and entertaining thing. So it, it's weird that they kind of fuck it up here. Out once you leave like, the valley proper. They're just like, let's just... And then turn the temple upside down. Play the song a bunch of times. I don't think it's bad. I just think it's unclear in vaguely disturbing ways. I think it's a positive. Like, I think it's my favorite area of the game. Because, like, it feels the most... Like, the other areas are very tied to the masks you get, like Mm -hmm. the characters, and they in that way they feel more familiar to Zelda. Like, oh, it's the Zora village, it's the Deku village, it's the Goron village. Right. Icona Valley feels much more unique and I think they they played with that more and it it feels more like I didn't know what was gonna happen or what to expect. So I liked that. But I agree it was very very mind boggling. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm of two minds about the uh, appropriately, I guess, of Stone Tower Temple. Uh, well, the temple itself, I just kind of thought was good. Yeah, but the the area in general, I really like. Mm. Yeah, I, I think when you pull back, the the temple design feels like the least, not maybe not the least realized, but like the most video gamey. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that that's the kind of the thing that disappoints. Like I enjoy a lot of it except for playing that song so many times 
Uh, and then yeah, we watch the cutscene, put the mask on, play the song, walk away, do it again with all the buttons. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really feel like the Elegy of Emptiness should have just been like Y Y Y X X X or something <laughs> like. So you didn't have to keep bringing up or like writing down the song, so you just could do it faster. Yeah. Or just like make it so it doesn't have to play it again. Yeah, like some kind of it. a hot key, <laughs> yeah. or some kind of something <laughs> to use the Elegy of Emptiness, like an emblem or something you just use the emblem of emptiness. Yeah. It'd be way per- better. Boom, perfect, I did it. Yep, nailed it. <laughs> Hold on, wait, I'm There's enough phone songs call. You had in the game <laughs> already. You don't need another. Yeah. It's true. And there's even songs they don't really tell you about either, which is an amazing little bit. What do you mean? Uh, like So, you told me about the reverse song of time, and you're like, I don't even remember if the game tells you about this. The Scarecrow does tell you about it. Okay. And he tells you about the song of double time. He also tells you about the yeah. song of double time. So, okay. it's neither of those. Right. Well, that is mostly what I was referring okay, to. Okay, yeah. I had just like, forgotten on the Scarecrow f- told yeah, you. On the first cycle, he doesn't tell you. Mm-hmm. But then after that, if you go back to him to, you know, dance the night away to pass the time. Right. Which is so Nintendo <laughs> and great. It is. Um, he'll tell you, like, oh, there's this song, you know, you want me to tell you about it? And then you say yes, and then he tells you about those songs. Does he tell you the the notes to play? Or no, do you have he to tells that you... Out? He... He basically just blatantly tells you, but he says it in, like, a not straightforward way. Like, there's a song that you have to play the notes backwards, or, like, there's something that you have to play all the notes twice. Right. You know, so, and you know exactly what he's talking about, but he doesn't straightforward say it. That's a cooler implementation than I remembered, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's still, I, I like the idea at least of you having to use a little bit of intuition in order to get full functionality. Because that's just a cool thing, Yeah, that, would, that seems like something that they would do, too, to like put a secret song in. Yeah. I mean, there's already enough of that going on in this game as it is. Mm-hmm. Like, forcing you to use your own brain. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. Yeah. By the end of this game, does anyone know that you're the hero? I genuinely don't remember. Like, obviously the mask guy does, because he's pseudo-omniscient and weird. Uh, I would say no. Right? Like, what? Because uh, I didn't beat the game. Uh, right, uh, yet. But I know what happens. Mm. I never... Like, we'll get into this later. I never thought I'd actually play this game, for reasons I will tell. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, I know a lot of stuff about it, or, like, already going in. So I know how it ends... Uh, but I don't know the specifics, but right. I'm assuming you set everything back to before you ever even entered Termina at the end, and then you just leave and go back to a, your quest to find Navi right. from the beginning. So the specific that does exist that I like to assume means that everyone eventually found out about your heroism is uh, that at the end of the game they show like a carving of the four giants uh, lifting the moon while you and Skull Kid like share a moment and there's like a little heart. So I just like, and it's just like on a tree stump in the woods. No, so, so Skull Kid carved it. Yeah, no. Skull Kid definitely knows. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And is alive. But he's not going to tell anybody. He might. I, we don't know really jack shit about what Skull Kid's actually like. I guess. Uh, Would they even be happy if they knew? Because the second they learn of your heroism, they also learn of the true and irrevocable death of all these other <laughs> important people. Uh, well, it also depends on whether or not the townspeople are ready and willing to understand the multiple worlds. Yeah, they probably there. just wouldn't. They probably just wouldn't believe it. Yeah, they probably just wouldn't care. They're yeah. like, I'm dead in so many other <laughs> universes. Yeah, 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 kid. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the most dismissive townspeople in the history of townspeople. That's a high standard of well, dismissiveness. To in their cross. defense, uh, why would you give a shit about anything with the moon? Uh, coming to crash down on the town. Well, a lot of them don't seem to give a shit and also don't seem to give a shit about the well, moon. Yeah, I think it's that implied that they're all just in denial. Because everybody's mood changes on the third day. Yeah. yeah. And they start rushing around. Yeah, so they're just like trying to ignore it. The uh, I find this 100% believable and understandable because... As a person in the real world, if anyone under the age of, like, 
16 approached me about anything, I would ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> Not even dismiss them, just ignore just, them? Just, like, pretend really? they don't exist. Well, I mean, do, maybe di- maybe be dismissive generally toward their... If a 12-year-old walked up to you and went, hey, I just saved the world, or alternatively, like, hey, uh, if you do this thing, then a bad thing won't happen, you would just go, like, Whatever, get out of here, you snot nose brat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What you, the, the social norm here is you give the child the absolute least amount of effort that confirms their pre existing beliefs and doesn't challenge their thought process at all. Right, because so that's what their parents are for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you just be like, that's great, kid. And then they leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what people actually do, and that is why that they do it. Uh, but if just from your description, I was assuming that a kid would come up to you and be like, hey, mister, do you want to buy some Girl Scout cookies? <laughs> just walk the fuck away. away. <laughs> <laughs> and you would just be completely stone-faced. Though. I would 100% do that depending on... I feel like there's a sliding scale for me, <laughs> and it's like up to a certain age, I would just pretend that they weren't there. What? Uh, I just... I only being around like really little kids... Uh, so you just go, you go to your happy place where there aren't any kids. Right. Well, I mean, uh, my thought process is like I'm a big clumsy dude, and I don't <laughs> want to be around anybody's kids for any reason. I want them to be contained within their individual <laughs> families and have me exist in a bubble outside of that where there are no kids. So if a kid that was like four or five came up to me, I would literally just walk away and have done this before. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if some of these townspeople walking around like, I'm not going to interact with this kid, even to reinforce their preconceived notions, mm-hmm. uh, even though the kid has a sword. <laughs> <laughs> I did overlook that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because the moon is crashing, and I have no time to spare with this kid's shenanigans. Mm-hmm. I got to deliver letters. I got to serve milk to these thirsty people. I gotta go meet my fiancé before we all die. These are all important things Mm -hmm. that Link is just interrupting. And you do kind of look like Tingle, which is a good reason to ignore you. Who is like a resident of Clock Town and everyone is aware of. Yeah, everyone knows that person and their familiarity with him, I imagine, not positive. Right. So, any, any Link distance... You really should have picked a different outfit, I guess. Uh, well, like... it's it's implied that Tangle picked his outfit based on the traditional garb of the people that you come from. Mm-hmm. So there really wasn't much of a way around it. Yeah. In that scenario, kind of spoiled the water, I guess. Yeah. What you could have done is not continued wearing it while impersonating other people, because like you've never seen a Goron wearing a hat before. But like, by God, here's <laughs> Link the Goron walking around with a fucking hat on, and like does not raise suspicions at all i think it would have been like really funny and great if they would have had uh, zora link have the hat over top of the, <laughs> in the back. that would have actually been very good yes uh, uh, anyway. uh i feel like we need to, to focus in on something hone in a little bit and i think that the the conjoining factor of everything that we've just been talking about is clock town and i love clock town uh, never has there been like a hub in a Zelda game that felt more like a treasure trove of shit than <laughs> uh, than Clock Town. Like you just walk around and you see stuff, heart pieces, rubies, crates, jars, and shit, and you're like, I gotta figure out how to get there and do that thing. All self-contained within this like little like four screens, and it's just masterfully done. Well, uh, this could be where I can go into my history with the game. I could easily segue into it from here. Um, It might be so densely and well-designed that it would be completely off-putting to somebody picking up the game for the first time, as was my first experience with this game. So, in high school... uh, Matt lent me, he had the pre-order GameCube disc with the oh. Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask on it for, yeah, right. for the Wind Waker. And he lent me that because I'd never played Ocarina of Time. Played through Ocarina of Time. And then I was like, oh, while well, I have this, might as well check out Majora's Mask. Jumped into Majora's Mask and, like, I had, like, knew, like, basically what it was about. Like, I knew that, like, 
the NPCs had like routines that they would go through mm-hmm. and like you had to like reverse time to like do the side quests and whatever, like the basic premise. And I was like, so I like I, I go into the game and like the first one of the first things that happen is like the postman comes out of his house and I'm like, Oh, I go talk to him and like I'm like he says whatever and i'm like okay was that important like i don't know is that something i'm supposed to care about right now like how do i progress and then i'm like okay i guess i'll ignore it and then like i keep going and then i get to the part where the kids shooting the things with the balloon and tingles floating around and the fairies there and it's like i ended up being in that area like at nighttime the woman comes in she gets mugged i'm like was that important like i I didn't get her and i didn't get the guy before he ran away so i was like uh, did I fuck up? Do I need to do that over? <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, right. and like stuff like that keep happening. And like, I didn't know what I was supposed to pay attention to and what was important. Mm-hmm. And it like, just, I would get through the first cycle of days where you get the ocarina back and be put into clock town. And the game like tells you like, Hey, go to Woodfall temple or whatever. But I'm like, I need to figure out what's happening. In this <laughs> All town. this stuff. So I'm like going around the town <laughs> trying to like figure out stuff. And it's like, it, and it's just like all felt so overwhelming that I just like put the game down and I tried to pick it back up maybe three more times. Uh, and same thing happened each time. Like it just felt like too daunting and uh, so that was how, like, my first experience went with uh, Majora's Mask. Right. Man, if it was that bad for you to interact with the, like, fake, put-on complexity of the lives of these fictional characters. Yeah, I just, I just, for some reason, assumed it was all way more important than it was. <laughs> like, I assumed this game was, like, the hardest version of itself that it could be, where I actually <laughs> had to keep track of all this stuff and, like, use that knowledge to, like, do some crazy thing. Right. Like, I feel like the game on the first cycle, like, right off the bat, should give you the Bomber's Notebook. That's probably true. Like, but they don't give it to you to the second cycle. It's like, to be like, okay, all this stuff happens at the same times each time and you don't need to like worry about most of its optional like i don't know like yeah. i it's a unique experience because i had like a weird perception of what the game was like and you went in like frankly i guess most people would these days knowing that time is going to reverse itself yeah i don't think you'd consider a lot of the stuff that would happening except maybe the old lady being mugged as like initially <laughs> important on the first run through i know if i was playing like Breath of the Wild, and I saw one just get their shit totally jacked in the middle of one of those like horse stables. Like I, mm. I would presume that to be important. That was probably one of the worst like set up one of these random encounters because uh, it's in an area that you have to be in to progress, and it's just it, like a day. In Majora's Mask is like what like eight minutes or something. <laughs> it's like not very long. Yeah, you don't have a whole lot of time. So if you're you walk around, you explore, you figure out what's going on, and if you happen to show up there at night, you you know figure out you get the the bubble blowing ability, whatever. You uh, talk to the kid. You start the whole quest to go find all the the bombers, and you pop the balloon. It's probably nighttime. That guy just, pr- just or that woman walks in. That dude prances on over to her and just you know jacks her shit. <laughs> And, like, probably at least 50% of people who are playing this are going to see that on the first night and just be like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> they do like the idea that this is the hardest version of the, that the game could be. Like, I want to see Kaizo Majora's Mask. <laughs> <laughs> Where, like, in the end, there's just this, like, crazy Rube Goldberg machine of, like, dozens of things happening at simultaneously, and then, like, all converge in one <laughs> mega event, and, like, it ends up with just, like, the postman mails the moon back to space. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, like, with all that being said, I don't think, like, if I were in charge, I would really change it all that much, because, like, that first cycle is really supposed to make you feel uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and so that's why it's designed that way. Like, you, you're not supposed to feel like you know what you're doing. Um... But, like, I don't know, there's, I feel like there's something that they should do to kind of, like, ease you in that they just don't. I don't know. The first thing... I appreciate it, like, what it's doing, like, thematically, but, like, man, did it not gel with me. I was under the impression that the initial not gelling toward you was due more 
to the time mechanic than the way that the complexity well, of uh, the initial world overwhelmed. That's another thing, is that I generally... That on paper, like, the idea of this game sounds just awful to me. Like, <laughs> having to, like, reset your progress is something that I really don't like. It's a reason I don't like the roguelike genre at all, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, like... And that added in, like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to do all this again, you know, like, you know, that feeling. So that definitely added, but I was willing, like, I knew about it going in, so I was willing to, like, at least put up with it. Right. So, like, it, the the initial design of Clock Town is what really drove me off the first time. Yeah, you could probably do with, like, a notch or two of intimidation factor brought down. So I'm wondering how your first experience with Clock Town was. I don't know, when did you play this game originally? I think I got it right after it launched for the 3DS. Okay. I did never played it on the N64, and was always kind of vaguely interested in it, but just mm-hmm. waited for the re-release that I presumed was inevitable and was right. Uh, but, yeah, I got into this game pretty hard pretty quick and had lots of internal arguments with myself for a long time before Breath of the Wild came out and settled all of them forever but whether it was my favorite Zelda game in comparison to uh hold your purse Chad because I know that you'll drop it like out of shock uh when I say uh that it, it's the the Wii one that used to be my favorite Twilight Princess Skyward Sword Skyward, Skyward Sword, Sword. Sky- Ooh. yep Skyward Ooh. Sword versus Majora's Mask Twilight Princess is equally a not okay choice as your favorite <laughs> Twilight uh, Princess was my favorite uh, for a long time. I just disagree with people's opinions on Zelda games, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I just didn't like Twilight Princess because it was fucking, like, the longest game I've ever played in my whole life. That's not but even see, close to I know. It came out when I was 14. Like, I, yeah. it just hit a sweet spot for me. That's, like, like the perfect 14-year-old oh, game. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, yeah. yeah it's, like, it's like the action-adventure game, like, besides Kingdom Hearts. That, like, I had, like, always wanted but didn't know. Right. Because I hadn't played Ocarina yet. I played it before Ocarina, which is a huge factor there. Yeah. But, uh... That's my deal with Wind Waker as well. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. But, yeah, so, like, that just really hit the spot for me. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's... Mm-hmm. That's that. So, when you went into Clock Town, having played a number of Zelda games prior... I ignored... You were not... I ignored them and their problems. I, I just didn't care about them at all. I continued progressing... Uh, and it was only very late in the game when I played for the first time when I realized quite how much of a Rubik's Cube was there, mm-hmm. uh, and then I dug into it real hard. But that was, like, after Dungeon 2 or 3. Okay, See, so... I feel like that's the ideal way for it to happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we found the key factor because, obviously, I didn't talk to anybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and just ran through the first couple of things... Um, like, I recognized things were going on, I recognized that they were important, but because I knew that they were side quests, and I don't know how I knew that, whether it was just from hearsay, or, like, I tried to engage with a few and kind of, like, got a side questy vibe mm-hmm. out of it, mm-hmm. um, but because of that, I sort of, like, came back to it later in the game, which, one, makes a lot of them significantly easier, because you have more tools at your disposal, um... It makes it, like, if you've collected a couple of masks and stuff, when you come back to some of these requests, you sort of have a toolbox to dig through as opposed to having to, like, conceptualize what the solution is going to be. Right. And so it ends up uh, being a lot simpler to, to solve. Like, I, I, I don't even... I, I don't have an example right now, I guess, because it's been so long since the first time I've played this. But, uh, yeah. So I think that's what it is. You just have to... Uh, be a an unfeeling, unthinking. Yeah. I think I just got super unlucky, like the first time I played it, because like I feel like I ran into like most of the NPCs like doing their thing uh, while I was exploring, and like the, the when I played it for the cast this time, like I didn't like see any of that my first time through. So right. I was like, "What? Well, I wish this would have happened all the other times." I played <laughs> like, you gotta really up your indifference to yeah, human like, misery. Basically, I, it's weird though because like this time I was like, "I'm gonna ignore that stuff." And just try to like get to the first temple. Like I feel like if I can get that far, like I'll I'll be able to like settle in, and and I just ended up kind of like playing it the way I normally play games. I usually kind of like plow into like the main progression before I like pay attention to other stuff. Right. So I like to get my foot in the door, and uh, but it's it's weird that I didn't play it that way the first time. <laughs> like I don't know what it was. It was a different time, different I era, guess. different Andy. 
Different Andy. It was a different Andy for sure. Yeah. yeah. I imagine, like, because you said that you played it pretty much immediately after you Their finished. Ocarina. So, yeah, yeah. That, that influenced it. But I did try it a couple other times as well. True. I, I The the narrative that I have playing in my mind is that you finished it up and you're like, I'm going to return this, but I just want to try out Majora. And, like, if you're just sampling something, you're way more likely to do, like, side quests and stuff rather mm. than rush through the main plot. I guess that makes knowing sense. Knowing that you'll have to reset it. Little did you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Gosh. Um... I'm trying to think how. Let me look at the clock because I'm uh, gonna edit this. I feel like it's out. probably prime break time. I believe. Yeah. All right. In that case, rather than do that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rather than do what you're gonna do, are we still allowed to make Ponderosa prime rib jokes when the Ponderosa and Mouseville closed? I didn't even yeah. know. Yeah. Closed. I mean, yeah. Now they're like in. Uh... Memoriam to the Ponderosa. It's a tribute. To... Yeah, a tribute. Yeah, because I don't know where, where a single Ponderosa is now. I, don't, I can't pick out a, a specific Ponderosa location. Realistically, we should be making these jokes in celebration of the good that has come to this world <laughs> now that a Ponderosa has closed down. <laughs> True. Go ahead and make the joke. No, what, what do you mean? What joke? I, which pond- you were just <laughs> you were just thinking about that out of nowhere. <laughs> that, that the Ponderosa closed because you said prime rib, and I was like, oh, like I, I like, said prime. You rib. never said prime rib, not even <laughs> once. <laughs> I said it's prime time for a break. Oh, oh okay, that's the, that's the prime. Prime yeah. time. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys. Or I said it's prime break time. That's yeah. what I said. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, guys, you do break listening breaks. to the podcast, I'm sorry. I'm just going to break in here real quick. Uh, we need to take a break, not for any reason other than I think that we might all be going insane. <laughs> um, so we'll return with the dawn of the second day, mm-hmm. but we're not doing it in three acts, so it'll be the second and third, and you'll just have to determine when it's the end. I'll clear the voices of Rip from my mind, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Bam, bam. Was that the this was the order, order. <laughs> Oh god yeah. damn. I was going for the, the chiming at the end of the day yeah. and I gave up laughing. Alright, let's get out of time. And that's what Law and Order is and how it was made. Why does this game have a mask? Of like a guy with huge eyebrows. Like of all the mechanics that they could have picked and masks they could have made and did, they decided to create masks of some of the most nonsensical one-off things. There are some masks that seem important but aren't, and other masks that don't look important but very much are. Right. I thought the all night mask would be this huge deal because it looks like some kind of like filigree bondage gear that's like applied to your face. So of course, because this is a video game, if it's like filigree bondage gear, it's got to be like a really like powerful artifact of some kind. Right. But it's just used for like so you don't fall asleep while listening to an old woman. Right. The thing that comes to mind like when I think about like the cuz there's there's a huge number of masks in this game. Mm-hmm. Um and the All Night Mask, as an example, and I love the example because the All Night Mask is like one of my favorite masks in the game, like, <laughs> aesthetically. Um, and actually, the quest itself is, is one of those things that I also love. Mm-hmm. Um, is a kind of nonsensical inclusion and presents you with a mechanical benefit because at the end of the quest, you get a piece of heart. Yeah. Whereas something along the lines of, like, the Bunny Hood, which is entirely stupid like just the like a rabbit mask like doesn't tie in thematically to anything in the game Mm -hmm. uh provides you with a consistent mechanical benefit of being able to move faster yes um and see time when the magic postman takes it off of the screen um and I, I think that they kind of juxtapose, like, how, like, crazy and unique something is versus the reward it presents you, oftentimes. Like, the, I never remember what the letters in this guy's name are, like, Kefli? Coffee? Kef, coffee? Yeah. Coffee? Ka- ka- coffee? Coffee. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, his mask gives you very little, like, actual benefit, but is the most involved thing to get in the whole game. Uh, and that kind of thing, like, I, I felt like they tried to balance it in that kind of a way so that individual rewards are sort of doled out on a more consistent basis, I think. Mm-hmm. Um. One thing that specific example you gave, though the all night mask specifically, mm-hmm. does it's a weird case because it does seem like that could have had like a way bigger mechanical implication. Like you couldn't make it all the way through the night without sleeping unless you had the all night mask. Right. That sounds like a cool idea. Maybe they tried it and they didn't like it so they ended up keeping it in the game and just using it as like a silly side quest. Right. The description of the all night mask also makes it seem like way more fucking crazy than it is cuz it like the description's like it's a cursed mask that once you put it on it you can never take it off or it rips the soul from your bones. Like I, I don't remember the exact wording, but it is dramatic as fuck. Yeah. Uh and like the actual mechanical implementation of it is just it's a mask that you take take off and put back on again with no soul rending <laughs> implications at all. Yeah. Uh the masks just keep you on your toes so much. You never, ever know what to expect when you get one. You also never know what's going to end up giving you one. Yeah. Unless it's, mm-hmm. like, painfully obvious. Yes. Anything could happen, really, in this game. I love the, the way that they did the mask slots, even on the 3DS, where it seemed like the possibility space was so wide. Wide enough that I think it totally makes up for how many items are absent here. Mm-hmm. But that one screen could be full of items that are like you know will completely change the way that you play the game on a moment to moment basis like the bunny hood or it could just be like a cow or you could just have like a cow on your face and <laughs> nothing else which is like most things in the game used for like one thing yeah it's like yeah. it's trophies are whole mechanics and you're always unclear on that and the visuals don't really indicate it one way or the other either mm. so it's very very touchy yeah, it's definitely a smart move um, to have some of them be insignificant and from a design perspective. But like the yeah, the weird thing is is that it's Nintendo and they took the time to make even the one-off ones seem really cool and interesting. <laughs> so that when you only use them one time, you're kind of like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, and you can put them on just walk around if you yeah, want. So there's always that. Mm-hmm. I always like. Because the ones that I like the most from a, a, a video game standpoint and where a lot of games kind of would have probably just stopped are things like... So the transformation masks are obvious and I'm sure that we'll get uh, further into those because they're kind of important. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the bunny hood, the blast mask, uh, I can't... I, li- I can almost... Th- that's kind of all I can think of that I use, like, at with any sense of regularity. I figured you'd be a big stone mask guy. The stone mask is good in a lot of cool ways. Uh, but yeah, I did kind of forget about that. Stone mask, definitely. A plus. Good mask. Uh, and then so many of the other ones just, like, could have been taken out of the game and it would play similarly, but... The, the game just wouldn't be Majora's Mask uh, w- without them. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I love the implementation overall, and uh, the only stumbling point I feel like it actually had is the your reward for finding all of them. Uh, really? Yeah. I'm surprised that you're, you're anti-fierce deity train. Is it because your reward for finding the masks is not getting a boss battle? Yeah, that's sort of it. Because it makes the game end on sort of an anti-climax. It, it feels like it should be like the biggest climax where Link ascends from being a like person and turns into a combat god <laughs> who fires laser beams and has face paint on like a football player. But... It's uh, it's more of a tribal. It is a tribal. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to make it sound warrior. less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to make it less cool than tribal warrior. Yeah, I was, and I went with football flair. Mm-hmm. Um, so we all know where I stand on on football mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and tribal warriors. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, but it, and, and it is cool. Like, I like the design. I think it looks cool. I like that they added it to Breath of the Wild through an amiibo so that, like, you can walk around looking like the Fierce Deity. It's like a costume in Smash Brothers. It's it's kind of an iconic look mm-hmm. for Link, even though it's I, technically not Link. But the the reward of just being like, oh, final boss is easy now, is sucks. Like, it feels bad, like, to just demolish the final boss and then just walk off into the sunset. It is does feel kind of like backwards design, where like your reward for like being the kind of person who really liked the game and really dug into it is that you you yeah you just get like a free pass to just like not even have to care about the final boss. <laughs> and I, if anything, you think you should like make it harder, right? Like, like a you calamity would... ring situation. <laughs> my my, because i'm assuming that you have the option to just not use it yes but like who's gonna take that option yeah yeah yeah, you you, you went to the trouble of getting it this is the one time you can use it you literally spent like 10 hours longer in the game than you would have needed to to just get to the end you're not just gonna be like oh just toss that in the fucking garbage (laughs) Give me the give me the real shit. Oh, laser sword, nah, nah, nah. no laser sword. Yeah, I feel like they kind of dropped the ball in general with the very very final incarna- incarnation of Majora. Like it was, <laughs> it evoked, it evoked, it, evoked. it did the <laughs> act of evoking. <laughs> Which one's the final form? The uh, one with the tentacles. Or... Dancy cool guy. Oh, yeah, with the arms and legs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. silly dancy cool Majora's dude. incarnation. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I, don't get me wrong. I like the fact that they made the choice to make the final boss like zany dancy guy. Yeah, it played up the <laughs> mat. <laughs> you like that? I did. You like z- zany dancy guy? <laughs> I liked that they made th- that not only because it subverts that expectation for what the final incarnation of Majora will be, mm-hmm. but it st- continues to play up the weird connections between Majora as this demonic force. And Majora as this like childlike innocence that destroys without caring. Right. Yeah, I kind of took that as being like some of the Skull Kid's personality bleeding in. True. Yeah, like because like Skull Kid takes the power of the Majora's mask, which could just end the world, and he chooses to be like a trickster. Mm-hmm. Like I always took took it that like Majora is not like a trickster god. And that was Skull Kid's influence. Yeah. Personally. That all Majora was was the darkness behind those giant eyes and nothing more. Well, maybe, maybe not just that. But. The, the eyes are actually what I was going to bring up as to why I don't like this version of, of Majora. And it's not because I don't like the eyes, it's because I love the eyes. Mm-hmm. I love the design of Majora's Mask. I think it's like, I mean, obviously it's become sort of a video game icon. Yeah. But... Uh, the way that the Majora is described in like hushed tones throughout the game, um, and by that I mean specifically by exactly two characters, um, is as sort of a, a like a very evil entity. And I mean, Zelda the franchise deals with evil entities all the time, and they take a lot of different forms. Mm-hmm. But Majora feels so uniquely grounded in this like downtrodden tone that when Majora turns into a dancing zany man, <laughs> it kind of it, it robs the mask of some of its menace. I agree. Mm-hmm. Here's my pitch. Alright. Because again, I open this, I, I do think that they dropped the ball. But the ball that they dropped is that that shouldn't have been the last Majora form. After getting fe- Fierce Deity sort it of unlocked. It feels like it should like, be the first one. Yeah. Fierce Deity should, should like unlock third form true Majora. Where, like, you face... Well, you're not just defeating, like, one present incarnation of the mask. Right. But you're, like, defeating the darkness that curses the mask forever. I wanted there to be some kind of, like, horror morph after that point when you fight Majora that never arrives. It would make a lot of sense if he starts out the trickster way and then becomes progressively less and less uh, goofy as it goes. Yes. Like, he has, like, three forms. And then if you get the Fierce Deity mask, you then, like, venture inside Majora... To fight the demon within. Precisely. I like your idea. Also, it would be kind of weird because you're going into like a pocket dimension and then de- delving deeper into a into a further Maybe pocket dimension. Maybe you put the mask on. That would make sense. And, and then, then it, even if you're you first get... Link, you come back as... Can we... Wait. <laughs> wait, alright, no. We can only travel back in time in Majora's Mask. Yeah. Not in the real world no. right now to <laughs> fix Majora. That's why we have to go into the future and make Majora's Mask 2. <laughs> two. <In> 2000. <laughs> where, it's, where, it's, where it's the same game, but with a different... 
<laughs> it's a really good game. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> all that said, mm-hmm. I did thoroughly enjoy the process of collecting all of the masks. Yes. Because I, in in the number of times that I've played this game, too, uh, I did one run that was just like a normal ass. I played a video game run, <laughs> and I played the video game, and I got to the end, and I liked the Majora fight. Except, I actually don't, like, because as much as we complain about the design of, of uh, Majora's incarnation, right? the mask part of the fight sucks. Like, it's kind of boring, and if it's not boring, you just, like, die instantly, and, it, and it's worse mm-hmm. somehow. Uh, the second phase is fine. The tentacle phase, I'm, I'm okay with, mm-hmm. and I like the fight of the arms and legs one. Uh, but the m- most recent time that I actually finished it uh, is I just got everything. Like, a 100% whatever, not really 100%, but most of it. And the process of each of those masks, like all the side quests and everything, lends so much to why I love this game. So the masks are like a big ol' A+. Plus. Mm-hmm. All the little mini dungeons inside the moon? Mm-hmm. I kind of like this. The Zora one... Is like bonkers hard for no reason. But it's great. It, I don't know. I got frustrated. It was it the was it the Zora one? It's the one good? that's the race against time, right? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Fuck that one. That one's hard. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? Well, just sidebar. Uh, I don't want it to get too far away from the. You you mentioned you like the design of the Majora's Mask. And one thing I wanted to bring up about it is, as I was playing, I was like, I really like the color scheme of this game. Like, there's something about it that, like, feels very different for Zelda. It's, mm-hmm. like, standing out to me. And it took me, like, probably an embarrassingly long time to realize that they're sprinkling in the c- color scheme of the mask itself into the world in really cool ways. Like, in the swamp, in, like, Woodfall... It, that's the name of the whole area, right? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, the uh, potion hag. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yes, the potion hag. Uh, Correct. You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, the, her tree is like, it's like a big tree, and it has like this design around it, and it's just the colors of the Majora's Mask. And it's like, mm. that stuff is like thrown in everywhere, and it's like a nice, like, subtle subconscious thing that you I think is always you notice even if you don't notice it. Right. You know what I mean? Is it, you say, took an embarrassingly long time. I say, have played the game three times and never even considered it. So... <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere if you pay attention. Yeah, I know you don't do that. <laughs> hey, it's <man. laughs> Jesus. Uh, what do anyway, you want from me next? Uh, just, uh, just a little design tidbit. Yeah, the corruption is there if you are mm-hmm. inclined enough to see it. Alternatively, you could just look up and yeah. see the horrible moon face. It, it adds to that, like, almost, like, Twin Peaks kind of feeling that the game has where everything's like Hyrule, but kind of off. Mm-hmm. You know, it adds to that. But anyway. What's the expression of the moon? It's like a weird grimace. I don't know. Yeah, what's... Uh, I've heard I've heard it described in a lot of different... Like, because people love the moon. Oh, yeah. I also love the moon. I'm a um, moon fan. I found that no one agrees with me on this. Uh, so I've heard, like, yeah, like a grimace. I've heard anger. I don't think he's angry. I've heard sad. I've heard pained. I uh, think pained is probably the way I would lean. My interpretation is, like... <laughs> Excited, like it, like uh, <laughs> villainously joyous, like it's it's pumped to be destroying Clock Town. Uh, I disagree with that hard. Okay, I I feel like because like the moon is just it's like being brought down by Majora. Right. It's not in and of itself necessarily an evil entity. But the but the face wasn't on the moon before. Right, but that, that the... might even be like the face of Majora for all you know. Yeah, like, like the moon, well if it was the face of Majora he's totally yeah, pumped I about guess... <laughs> destroying Clocktown. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, because the I, I moon. Just, in a read of it where like the moon is actually like not into the fact that it's crashing into <laughs> that. That's more interesting. No, but yeah. you might be right. I I agree as well that it's more interesting. I just like every time like I look painful, at the moon, I, like I I see a different expression. Like I feel like the yep. first time I saw it. I definitely got, which I mean, I, I think the first time I saw it would have been in like Super Smash Brothers Melee, probably. And to me, that's when it looked like it was, it was, it was pumped about it. But then, like I've seen it a million times since then, and it's gone through like a million different. Experiences. That's actually, I actually think it looks like not significantly different, but notably different between the original version and the 3DS version. Mm-hmm. Uh, and. In a weird way. It's got those moon lips. Yeah, yeah like, it, it, it looks like it's a different expression. That Like, it's one of those <laughs> things where, like, I like it better in the N64 version, the way the moon looks. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Because I think in the N64 version, it, it, it does kind of look more angry, where in, like... I agree. In this version, it, look, it looks kind of weird. It's weird. I don't know. Yeah. I, I want to meet the person We look later. at an artistic, like, an, an artist's representation of the moon, like, every single day, because we have that poster. Oh, yeah. And it's got, like, an over-the-shoulder kind of thing on. They gave the moon a shoulder to look at. Yeah, like, the moon is, like, a little sassy in that image. And yeah. that's, like, an official promotional image. And I don't know what the fuck. But it's important to note here that... The moon, while the moon, like the celestial body and like even our like literary metaphorical understanding of the moon, never considers the moon's like feelings. <laughs> and additionally, uh, because that is not something that is traditionally associated with the moon, part of why it's so fucking disturbing in this game, because you don't, you just don't expect it when you go in, unless you're just privy to it. Yeah. As I feel like most people just are at this point. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it really... I didn't find it that impactful for me, because I already knew about it. Yeah. Like, there would be times where, like, you know, like you do, like, you kind of forget about it, and then you'd see it, and then I'm like, oh, uh, I feel like this should be, like, more, like... Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, it's like, awe inspiring. It's like the know? Darth oh, Vader shit. reveal. Like you yeah. watch, like you watch Empire, yeah, and you're like, I wonder what this was like for someone who actually didn't know this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean like the Dar- not the Darth like, Vader face reveal? No, no, on no. Twitch. <laughs> like the Darth Vader, I am your father moment. I yes. said Empire. Yes. Yeah. Well, you said Empire after you said the first part, and what I was thinking is when they're like putting his helmet on, <laughs> like that in his and weird his time. egg thing. Whatever. Yeah. God. Enough of the Darth Vader egg thing. <laughs> I, I, this was forever ago, but I so agree that the moon's face is something that we read our own feelings into to like a disturbing degree. Like I need to find an interview, and I tried before this mm-hmm. of the guy who literally just like came designed up it. or designed with the moon face, and like what his intent <laughs> was, how he iterated on the moon face. It's so perfect for, like, the strange, hostile, unknowing ambiguity that just permeates everything about, like, Termina or Termia, or however you pronounce it in this game. The setting of this game is unknown, familiar, hostile, and the closer you look into it, the less comfortable you get, and the moon is exactly the same. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, The point that I was getting at with that, and also uh, with my whole spiel about how Literary and metaphorical. It was like it was very good. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a great spiel. Chad. And it was and yeah, but uh, is that in addition to that, the moon is also like down a hole and mm-hmm. then around like a little hallway, and then further to that, the moon is also a hollow orb that contains a single tree and four children, as well as the Majora kid, mm-hmm. um, meaning that. <laughs> There's no fucking way that's the moon. Like, <laughs> it's just, it just isn't the moon. It's a moon like object that is crashing into Clock well, Town. It depends on how you read it. Like, um, the fact that when you go into the moon, it's like, yeah, like a pocket dimension, as you described it, where it's a big open field. It's almost like its own little biosphere. Right. With the tree in the middle. That's like one of my absolute favorite things. Well, it's is my favorite thing in the game and it's probably one of my favorite video game visuals ever for sure like yeah. i fucking love that and i was trying really trying to put into words why but like I, it's just it's so 
I don't. I don't even know. I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah. Like you, you expect horror and get a painting. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. It's, it's unexpected. It's, it's subversive. Yeah, in like just the best way. Yep. And it goes against the tone and aesthetic quality of the of the you know like the body of the game, except for the existence of those kids. Like they feel like, especially uh, Majora I- itself, but. To a lesser extent, the little happy mask salesman kids with the boss masks mm-hmm. um, all feel like, uh, like almost like a weird sort of blight on it because they're like running around doing their thing, having a good time because they're in an open field and they seem to be children, mm-hmm. but like they're just like not right enough to twist the knife a little bit more and just like drive like. You know that you're at the end of the game, and you want to put a stop to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like the exact opposite on the inside as it looks on the outside. And like, and like you said, like there's the kids there. It almost feels like like a religious parable or something, or like something from mythology. Right. Like some like a hero ventures into the moon and finds this weird like world inside of it. Like it I just, can 100% see like a fable about this. It yeah. just it has that kind of feel to it. It's just so. So great, and in that same vein, when I said that ain't the moon, I certainly I was not <laughs> intending to like give off the impression that I thought that like Skull Kid like made a paper mache moon <laughs> and then had it's it all crash down. Oh, no. Yeah, I just thought you were a moon skeptic. <laughs> you were just like, oh, there's no, no such thing. So, yeah. Well, how can the moon exist if the Earth is flat? Let's come on. Exactly. Um, but but uh, what I mean, were you making a Death Star joke? Also, that's, that's no that's moon. No, moon. <laughs> uh, no, what I what I mean to say is basically the entire like reality built up in Majora's Mask is constantly under question, question and that's by design. Yes, like yeah. they want you to be skeptical of the how literally you should be taking everything, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know. That's. They're successful at it. They're really successful at it. In a way that's subtle enough that it does not draw attention to itself except for the big moments where it needs to. Like, even things as simple as, oh, the last dungeon has a button you press that flips it upside down. It's not the dungeon that's flipping upside down. Like, the sky is below you. Yeah, like, Link falls and screams every time that you flip it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like, there, it, it's... That makes... There's no possible way you can conceive of that making anything close to physical sense, even with all the magic allowances that you normally make in these settings. Yeah. Uh, like, it's just not supposed to be real, and it's really, really scary and effective. Yeah, and there's, like, the popular theory that um, Link actually dies in the woods, like, when he falls down the hole and sees, like, the swirly mask images of Barrack like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> but, um... My, I always had to read on it that it was just like a parallel universe. That that that's always I like that idea better. I also that feel like different, like because like I like the, the the use of the same characters and stuff. I mm-hmm. like like the Bizarro kind of. I, I I like that read of it better. Personally, I, I like both a lot. I, I I feel as though Nintendo today would probably skew toward. Uh, saying it's an alternate universe just so that they can incorporate it into, like, the larger Zelda-verse. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but, I mean, I overall prefer uh, it being, like, death or a dreamlike state. I I feel like it's, it's novel that this is the only Zelda game that somebody could legitimately compare to The Wizard of Oz, yeah. and they would have, mm-hmm. like, a, a valid argument to make about it. Uh... All of it just kind of goes into this, like, swirling vortex of not knowing that drives, like, Mm -hmm. your overall... And, for example, uh, like you said, they used to reuse a lot of the models from uh, Ocarina. But not all of them. And some of the ones they chose not to use are, like... Super fucked up and weird. Like the like, why why do the slimes have like weird faces now? And it's like, oh, there weren't Jews in Ocarina of Time. Oh, there aren't Jews in Ocarina of Time. 
why is there a terrifying horror face constantly staring back at you from the mirror shield? <laughs> yeah. Wait, is that supposed to be my face? Is that what the game is telling me? <laughs> they assume that the player the whole time is just like, oh. <laughs> I made the face while it's on the mirror shield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Audio only format. Kind of forgot really, for a second. Yep, yep, yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Man, yeah, I don't think... They had they made this game in a year, right? Something yeah. like that, a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little I think more. it was like a year and a half. Sure, they made that game in what is to the modern day a hilariously small amount of time, uh, and I don't think they thought or cared about the explanation. Like, no, I agree. I was yeah. just gonna say that I think because the um, the game being like an allegory for death is like a very well like founded and explained theory. Right. That, but like. I don't think it's supposed to be like literal. Nope. In the game, like I think it it work. It's supposed to be more of like a just a thematic thing, just like a symbolic or. A, they only cared you know about I mean? it as much as they wanted to make you feel something particular. Yeah. And they succeeded in that. And I don't care where it fits into the mythology because I don't want an explanation of anything that happened here. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's just supposed to be like metaphorical yep. and in mm-hmm. the background. Why was Aesop so good at like making up? Like, why is why do like Aesop's weird stories become like these stories that are like? I don't know. I I'm not. Uh, what is somebody that studies fables? That's probably a like a, a thing. Oh, like a a fablist. I don't know. I was just gonna say a literary scholar, but now yeah. I'm looking for like. We'll a just go with that. Title. I'm not a literary scholar, JJ. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> My guess is probably that it's like the earliest recorded type like version of this and they just fucking credited him with everything oh so like most businesses yeah. he just got it on the I ground always, floor yeah exactly. i always assumed that he didn't actually write them all Aesop is now the ceo of fables <laughs> <laughs> it, it was probably one of the earlier like like recorded and circulated like mm-hmm. bunch of stories like that <laughs> Some probably I don't know. Let's speculate more on why fables exist. Hey, this conversation right. sucks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't know anything about this. <laughs> Let's do uh, a little bit of mechanical nitpicking. How about that? Oh yeah, nitpicking. <laughs> yeah, woo. woo. Before oh. we do that, okay. I oh, I can't believe this didn't come up, but um, the animations for the transformation masks, like putting them on. Also true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of horrible. Gross. Like, yes. Hurts. But like in like the best way, like an effective way. It yeah. Like you. a good horrible. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. I agree. And it, and it, and it plays along with the same thing. Like, uh, whatever Link puts on one of the masks, he basically makes the expression that's on the mirror shield. And then also everyone else also always has the expression that's on the mirror shield because the game is just laden with despair. <laughs> like everybody is just fucked up all the time. Yeah. And it, it kind of harkens back to what we talked about uh, earlier, where it's one of those things where initially it's like really impactful when you see that in you know like Link screams horribly, makes a terrible face, <laughs> lots of swirly stuffs going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then like you realize you can skip that animation, <laughs> uh, so you do. But like you know you'll you'll see it a couple more times. You know like you'll let it play, and it, it kind of like waves over you like. That that's happening to him every single time he puts one of those on. Mm-hmm. And it's like one of those things that, yeah, like subconsciously like wears on you while you play. While I was looking for interviews about who came up with the moon face, right. I instead found an interview uh, that, along with some other small things, discussed the horror faces that come over people when they put the masks on. And apparently the like explicit intent of that is like... They wanted to show Link being completely psychologically overwhelmed by the spirits of the dead. Like, that's like word of God what that's Mm. supposed to be. And that's terrible. Oh, that actually makes sense because when you take it off, it doesn't happen. Yes. I feel like I would also enter into an existential state of unending despair if I was possessed by spirits and heard their voices within me, and then they were wrenched away after a time when they've served their purpose. But 
Yeah, that would, that is pretty good. Also, it's kind of necromancy when you think about it. Like the voices mm. of the dead live only to serve my cause. Well, if then... if we're gonna go down this route, we also have to talk about the fact that you, as a fucking person, go masquerading as dead people. That's one thing that really like that I didn't actually know about. It's like when you put on the mask, like the people think you are the person that the mask is of. Like, yeah. you go into the Goron town, they're like, hey, Darmani. Like, <laughs> and you're like, oh. And it, just... it gives it a really weird tone, especially in the Zora village, where, like, um, what's his name? Like, Makai or mm. something. Like, his, like, girlfriend is there, and, and it's just like, hey. <laughs> like, I saved our eggs. Uh, our, our eggs. Both yeah. of ours. yeah. This is weird. You know, it's like, super weird. Yeah, and yeah, and and Link just kind of. Th- this is the part where the pre- it's the, just Link doesn't respond to any of it. Yeah, and not only that, but uh, he doesn't have any animation during conversations either. Like you talk to people, and you were just perfectly fucking stationary, staring at them with lifeless eyes and like a, just a bit of a grin, which gives Link the impression of like. Man, am I sure pulling one over on these fools? <laughs> yeah. Which is so uncaring. It like, like, can't yeah. possibly be what Link is actually thinking. Yeah, it's just like, oh, this is awkward. I want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and they've made explicit reference in the the franchise to Link not saying things. Like, Link is, like, canonically mute. Yeah. Like, he never says anything. So it's super weird. Like, these people have to be like, I'm not sure if that's Darmani or if there's a guy in a Darmani costume <laughs> walking around, which is actually what's happening, but has to seem like just too crazy to be real. Yeah, yeah, because it's too good of a costume. Yeah, like, it's yeah. not like, like, you, he, the Zora guy is swimming and using magic powers. Like, he's doing, there's, it's not like he's going to come in, like, there's going to be a zipper that you're going to find somewhere. He is, for all intents and purposes, indistinguishable. From, so it's more like a, like a body snatchers. Yeah, no, it's, it's invasion of the body snatchers. It's the Stepford Wives. It's fucking. It's the thing. Yeah, it's everything that has ever <laughs> done this trope. But in every instance of this trope being done, the Link is evil or an alien or <laughs> well, he's trying to kill someone. And the exactly. fact that they never do like even a one-off thing where someone is suspicious that you're not actually the person yeah. seems weird. Everyone's just like, oh, hey, Darmani, nice hat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, I Oh, you're not going to say anything? <laughs> oh, well, I see ya. <laughs> like, no one cares. <laughs> Admittedly, now knowing, like, this becomes so much less weird when you consider the whole, it is the spirits entering his body thing. Mm-hmm. Because presumably there's some element of Darmani himself going, like, like fight like the earpiece <laughs> thing where Link goes up and he's like, "All right, so I'm approaching some Gorons here." And like, that, that one's Dave. Just tell him something about rocks, and he's like, "All right, you got it." And he's like, "Rocks?" And he's like, da- "Oh, Don't even Darmani, get me started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> classic Darmani." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. That's actually less sad than I was before about it. So that's at least one positive thing to come uh, out of this. If you go too far, it kind of wraps back around. Because what I was thinking when you were describing that was like, what if it's not Link at all, and what if it's literally Darmani, just with like Hulk style Link stretched out clothes? <laughs> and the bad part is that every time you take off the mask, it's that spirit of that dead person resolving to the to their oblivion and lack well, of existence see, again. That wouldn't make any sense though, because if they would just never, they would take, never the mask take the mask off. off. So Link still and they has would just like be like, they would, Link would put the mask on, and then they would immediately leave whatever Link was doing <laughs> and go back to their house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess they all had families and children, so they wouldn't just abandon those yeah. forever, mm-hmm. willingly. Yeah. I'm. A, I'm. I'm kind of sad now. Yeah. It's... All right. Mechanical. Nitpicking. Let's let's, let's do you up. <laughs> yeah. Let's do. Some... <laughs> Let's do some mechanical nitpicking. And by nitpicking, I just mean, like, kind of small, minor details. Because if you've ever played a Zelda game before, uh, you know how this game plays, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, the the big one for me, like, the one that I, I feel like had the most impact, at least on the way that I view this game, is that Link is, like, surprisingly way more acrobatic in this game. And your overall movement, and that includes the transformation masks feels so much smoother and so much more engaging than it is 
even in later Zelda games, like with the possible exception of Breath of the Wild, where you can climb everything and drive a fucking motorcycle, uh, <laughs> no other game has given you as many movement options as as this game does. It's even kind of like show offy. I remember when I first started replaying this game for the cast and then going through the, the tutorial section when you're hopping the logs. You hop the logs. It's the log thing every time. Yeah. Like it always reminds See, you of it. Having uh, only played the beginning a couple of times, I associated that flipping so heavily with that sequence that I thought that was just like a specific scripted thing <laughs> for that sequence. Mm. And then like later to get one of the masks, the pig one. Mm-hmm. You have to follow the Deku butler through the thing, and there's a part where you have to take off the Deku mask it to be regular Link so that you could flip between these platforms, and that took me forever to figure out, because mm-hmm. I, I didn't know the flipping <laughs> was an actual thing that mechanic. He yeah, yeah, Link just... can jump farther than the Deku scrub. He's just that limber. Yeah. 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 But I really like that. It feels good. good. Despite yeah. being stuffed into a Deku suit for so long. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wonder if it's, like, because he spent so much time canonically in the universe as an adult. Like, do you think if, like, you spent, like, if you were in an adult's the... body and then went back into a kid's body, do you think you'd have, like, a greater mastery of Because I, it is time itself changing, I'm going to go with no. <laughs> the one the reading that I like is that he becomes a kid again and it, like, scrunches his bones <laughs> down into, like, Bone springs, and then he can just like flip around. I think the actual implication, as funny as that is, <laughs> is that like he's just—it's supposed to like emphasize that he's more experienced this time. Mm-hmm. This is his second rodeo. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, fuck off, Bone Springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, while we're on this track, this is something I kind of wanted to talk about. Was um. Yeah, like, we play this game now, and the transformation masks don't seem like... Like, they're cool, and they definitely stand out, but they don't... Like, I feel like at the time, though, like, that would have seemed, like, so, like, novel or, like, super impressive that, like, the game not only has one playable character... He's got four different forms, and they're all, like, well-developed and polished... Like, I feel like that probably was, like, way cooler back then. And all of this was able to be done because they did this off the back of Ocarina of Time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were able to, like, iterate. And there's, like, a lot of really good, like, areas of polish that you wouldn't really get in other games. Like, even today. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I was... I, I'm struggling to come up with an example of a game that is like this that does this concept even half as well. Like, I, I, I can't think of a game where you have this many options in a single-player game that's balanced around being an adventure and having a toolbox and things to do. Because, like, what comes to mind is, like, oh, yeah, like a fighting game could have, like, 20 unique characters that all have completely different movesets and act differently, mm-hmm. but they're designed to stand opposing each other and punch until they die. And... This is like a game where Goron Link has to be able to get around in the world and not seem awkward and weird, and Zora Link has to be able to do the same thing, and when you have access to both of them, you shouldn't be able to solve puzzles that are required to be one without with the other one, and it's it's an insane amount of like minutia when you come right down to it, and this game just pulls it off. It, it makes it look effortless. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to like express like just how like good that aspect of it is Mm -hmm. it's like it's something that i'm actually really surprised doesn't happen really ever with games like that they take instead of just making like a direct sequel like to take the assets in like setting or characters from a game and do some like something different with them right like i feel like there's that's a really like unexplored like great avenue for games to try it's kind of the field of mods historically yeah yeah it's almost kind of like that it's similar to space uh, but um I, cause I i was thinking about this because i am a kingdom hearts nerd they should have instead of making chain of memories a game boy advance game they should have reused all the assets and made from it a kingdom PS2 hearts game. 1 and made it a ps2 game but anyway, food for thought. <laughs> yeah. No, because when, when you mentioned mods, like, because that does come to mind, like, uh, uh, things like Valve games that were, like, built out of mods of other games. So you'd have all these games that, like, 
feel really similar mechanically and shit, but they are their own unique, distinct games. Majora feels so much different to Ocarina than most of, like, that slice does from its predecessor. Uh, and I, I just honestly have no idea how they pulled it off in a year. Like, it seems like a, a crazy accomplishment. I agree. It's kind of how I describe this this game in general. A crazy accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, trying to think. Uh, what else do we want to touch on? I'm sure there's something, but I don't know. We might want to... People will be talking about this game so much longer after we're done with this podcast. Like, yeah. It's, it's almost... <laughs> It, it's never going to exhaust the kind of avenues for discussion, partially because of how vague it is, uh, but uh, more importantly because of just how much of a crazy bet this was yeah. that it ended up paying off. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's got a um, that element of putting a spin on something familiar, a unique spin on something familiar, strong thematic theming, and just really good execution. Like, it's really... In terms of, like, all the stuff they had to, like, get right to make the game work, they really did it perfectly. It's like, a, their priorities were in the right places, for yeah. sure. It's an art house game made by, like, one of the biggest names in the industry in, like, a year and change with reused assets. Like, when will that ever happen again? Probably never. Or just... I, I feel like it should, though. Yeah. I mean, if somebody I, try it. <laughs> realistically, I feel like it has. Like, something has come out that is like Probably. this that we aren't thinking of. But uh, I, I do agree. It's, um... I don't know. If, if we're considering this, like, uh, the final thoughts segment of the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, the, this game ends up uh, being sort of, like, one of my top, like examples of a incredibly well realized idea Mm -hmm. and that is kind of what drives uh my love of it because as has now been if it wasn't mentioned before has been mentioned a couple of times i don't really love ocarina i i feel like it's a game that uh just like doesn't hold my attention the way that i want zelda games to um and I the Majora it plays almost identically to it. Uh, Majora succeeds in every possible way that it could to exceed the expectations that I had for it based on playing Ocarina of Time. Um, but at the same time, I have to thank Ocarina for setting the groundwork for not just Majora's Mask, but like. 3D adventure games as a fucking genre, like, yeah. uh, so like I I, don't, I harbor no ill will toward the game. It's just not my cup of tea, and Majora's Mask isn't my cup of tea at all. But I, but does everything it puts every garnish on it that it could ever put on it to make me love it anyway. It's like your mug of Joe. Yes, sure. <laughs> uh, and now, I kind of want to know, since this is your first time playing it, and it's so recent, how it ended up uh, performing for you. Um. <laughs> was that you the wrong worded, choice? You worded that so yeah, well. Performing? Yeah, yeah, you know, like how you had the dance, the twi- the dancers in the in Clock Town get... Too Did much you... of a like a sexual and or like horsepower based connotation. Like, no. uh, stop talking about horses on this podcast already. <laughs> God damn. <right>. Um... <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I have a really weird relationship with this game, as I've explained, but it's also made my opinion on it like really weird because like the game was so off putting to me, but like. I've always found it super interesting. So, like, I, I, I would, I have watched playthroughs of it before. It's been a really long time, um, and like, I really think this game is a masterpiece. But my own personal experience with it has been like very tainted, you know, because right. of like my weird like experience. Like, if if I could wipe the experience of a game from my <laughs> mind to replay it again, like for the first time, like fresh. And I could only do that with one game. I would spend it on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, I have like tons of respect for it, and even playing playing it, had knowing a decent amount about it already, I felt like it held up. Um, yeah, everything to do in between dungeons is great. Like you know, and they'd say that's a strength it has over traditional Zelda games. I think, mm-hmm. and uh, I felt like the dungeons were maybe a little bit too streamlined for my taste. But like overall, like the overall experience is still great and holds up yeah to allay that a little bit uh any like apprehension i feel like this is definitely also as much as like we just like we're like oh this is final thoughts it's fucking amazing everything it does it does perfectly even if what it starts with isn't the greatest and then you know all of this discussion of it being a masterpiece Mm -hmm. this is also super not a game that you have to apologize for not liking like i don't think this is one of those games i feel like i like cheated myself Uh, out of a game (laughs) that i would have like fucking loved because i had like a bad initial experience with it though it does still star prominently a feature of games that generally puts you off from true so true i just wish it could have happened differently (laughs) (laughs) misconnections yes majora's mask uh like do you like experiencing a huge diversity of feelings and emotions in the video games that you play other than like dominance and accomplishment if the answer to that is yes play this game now like play it immediately like it's fantastic and if i wouldn't have played it years ago it would be one of the best games i've ever played for the podcast fuck yeah (laughs) <laughs> thank you for listening to no clip what are we talking about next time next time uh we're going to be talking about celeste uh we're staying on nintendo consoles <laughs> moving to a different genre i yeah i was just gonna say precision platformer for sure <laughs> uh and one with lots of str- weird options to make the precision platforming not as precise if you choose Woo-hoo! uh which is strange and a cool thing that we, I want to talk about. <laughs> yes! Uh, <laughs> until that time, you can get a hold of us on our website at noclippodcast.com, where you can find all of our uh, links to shit. We've got YouTube. we got ourselves a Twitter. We don't use it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find all of our old episodes. Uh, we've done episodes on uh, Breath of the Wild as well as Wind Waker, but don't listen to that one because it's really old. Uh <laughs> <laughs> remember to play the song of subscribe and <laughs> in where the all like mask <laughs> and Fuck. talk to all the NPCs in the comments <laughs> is there <laughs> I came up with that while I was mm. playing <laughs> good. <laughs> it's good, I like it. Solid, yeah good mm. ring that bell for the dawn of the third day. There you go, that works. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Smooth. Smooth. Thanks. Like chunky peanut butter. Oh, hey, before we leave. Yes? Uh, we wanted to address that we are releasing oh. uh, on a shitty garbage schedule. Um, specifically, we wanted to talk about the fact that this might go on for a little bit, or it might not. We're not even 100% sure right now, but their life events generally that are making it a lot harder for us to uh meet on a regular basis to actually do this Mm -hmm. to potentially rectify this uh andy and i have been discussing doing a shorter like bite-sized version talking about handheld games specifically uh called no clip pocket uh and we will probably release the first episode of that between this and the next episode on celeste uh, so, if you were listening to this, and we'll remind you at, on that one, give us some feedback on that if it's a cool thing, if you want us to move it to, like, a different feed, because you don't want it, like, clogging up this one. Not that there's much to clog up, given our, like, <laughs> flow right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, all that stuff, and, you know, support that when it happens. <laughs> Yes. Unclog your feed, support your stuff, give us <laughs> give us a speak. And smash that fucking <laughs> like button. <laughs>
I think horses just kind of suck. Oh, like the, the animal? Yeah. No, I, I would agree. Yeah, have you ever, like, interacted I mean, or tried to ride with I'm a horse? I'm terrified of horses. As you should be. As you should be. Yeah, I feel like this is... We're recognizing... People usually give me shit for this. <laughs> Because uh, like a, a horse is like a gi- like a giant muscle that could just effortlessly kill you, you know. Like, I do know. Yes. You know if you if you, if you cross that horse, <laughs> you better fucking say your prayers. Yeah, pick yeah. a god like, and pray. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I feel I feel like we've romanticized horses too much. I feel like we need to bring horses down to earth a little bit. We've romanticized horses. We've even associated horses with actual romance, which needs to not be a thing either. <laughs> yeah. Like I like when I think of a horse, I think of not just a horse, but like a muscular blonde dude riding it shirtless. <laughs> like that's the bareback, of course. Yeah. They, that's the only thing that I could think of. If somebody just says the word horse, but maybe I have a complex. No, no, no. <laughs> That's tied up in the horse bullion. Like, yeah. it's all there. Yeah. They're also kind of associated with women, too, because lots of, like, young girls like horses for some reason. I don't know if it's because of marketing well, or, I don't you know, know. What, like, Who's the horse's agent that's getting them marketed? I don't now? know, but, like, it's, like, a thing. No, of, no, it definitely is. We're not I don't know where it comes from, but... Nonviolent, powerful independence. That's what it okay, is. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Except we're debunking the nonviolent part right now. <laughs> well, no, 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 they have the capacity to be violent, but they aren't. Like it's not like it's a, it's a power fantasy that doesn't have to be expressed at the expense of other people. It's mm-hmm. about power and freedom. Right. You know what like a horse fly is, right? <laughs> It's like a, a, a giant large, fly. It's a big ass fly that mm-hmm. that tent that is named as such because it like flies around horses. Mm-hmm. And horses are like tuned as as beings to fight against these flies so that when they attach to the horse it reacts in a way to remove it and i feel like that has to translate to an instinct that if you touch a horse even a little bit (laughs) it would just murder you instantaneously (laughs) that's not how it works well sneaking up on a horse would be a bad idea that's what i'm thinking yeah you have to like approach the horse first another (laughs) thing put your hand on its nose or something like that another thing with the legend of zelda that's what i'd be afraid of yeah Yeah. (laughs) but anyway uh majora's mask (laughs) don't look a gift horse in the mouth because you'll see the severed hands that it is <laughs> chopped off in its time. It, 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 it's either going to eat the hand or spit it out. It's not just going to keep the hand. <laughs> no, it's like just got like a finger squirrel. stuck in its teeth. Yeah, uh, sure. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Yeah. Majora's Mask. 